um, public policy that we have to, um, to raise the skills of people in a country. Um, so the question was, <clears throat> you know, whether we could um, uh, translate a, a measure of time lost, you know, 12 weeks of schooling missed by um, all the, all the uh, pupils into a measure of skill and then going one step further again, um, if they miss school, they've lost skills, um, what are the implications for their futures? And, you know, and the implications are around, since skills, higher skills give you higher earning potential, you know, that, that's the kind of the chain that we're talking about, mm -hmm. that um, we wanted to be able to, the, the first question I think was, we want to be able to say, okay, 12 weeks of schooling equals how much skill loss, so much skill loss equals what are the implications of that so that was the first question i think yeah okay so that's very interesting and obviously what a lot of what replaced it was um homeschooling um particularly in the first few weeks before there was a sort of return ish to schools before the summer holidays um do you have any concerns about disparities in the sort of quality of the homeschooling that children are going to receive Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that became <clears throat> clear very, very early. Um, so uh, I have I have some friends whose children go to um, private schools, and they were saying, you know, actually, it's not that different. You know, their their child or their children was having were having um, kind of live lessons with their own actual teacher, and you know, spread around the screen with their own actual classmates. So apart from the fact that they were, you know, the big fact that they were at home and they couldn't really socialize in terms of learning, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Mm. Um, you know, in England, 7% of students go to private schools. So what about the, the other 93%? So obviously there's, there's huge variation. And, um, you know, I'm, I have to say, I'm very impressed with my fellow economists and social scientists. Really, after only a few weeks, we started to get some data on, you know, how home learning was working out. And, you know, as you may well expect, homework, home learning was not, um, you know, working out particularly well uh, for a lot of families. Um, the, you know, it depends on whether children have access to uh, somewhere quiet to study, depends on, you know, what their parents are doing, whether their parents are, um, you know, working from home. And so, uh, you know, finding time to help their children with some algebra or some geography is really hard. Um, and, and it depends, it depends on, you know, what the parents know. So if, if the parents are sort of, um, you know, highly educated, then probably they, they'll be able to help their children with the algebra or, you know, what do dinosaurs do? Or, you know, what is a gene? That kind of thing. Um, and less so if they're less highly educated depends on the sort of the non-cognitive abilities of parents, you know, have their patience, their, their ability to sort of understand how to teach something. Um, and, and of course, it depends on IT kit. It depends on whether you've got access to fast internet and to uh, enough network devices. And, you know, there are, there are going to be families where mum and dad are both working at home and maybe there are two or three children all at a, an age where they need to learn online. So, you know, five network devices is, is quite a big ask for probably most families, really. Um, and although that's, <clears throat> I put that at the bottom of, of the list there because I think that probably is less important than the other things, but it is the one thing that policymakers can help with. You know, they can provide a laptop. They can't provide um, an extra quiet room in the house, just you know, to keep your irritating younger sibling away, and so allow you to get on with things. So you've um, hinted there about the sort of intervention that policymakers can make when it comes to like, addressing this disparity. Um, do you think there are any additional um, interventions that the government needs to make now, aside from the whole uh, providing network devices, uh, to make up for the learning loss? I think it's hard. I mean, I, I um, and, and just incidentally, I mean, the you know this evidence is still coming in. There, were, there was a study mm -hmm. from the Netherlands um, last week, uh, and that's a country with a, a really sort of solid digital infrastructure, um, and uh, you know a lot of obviously very highly educated families, 
And the study was showing that a lot of students you know, basically learn nothing you know over eight weeks yeah. it, you know and mm. so i think i think this is a really really big problem particularly uh, if we're going to be or well, clearly we are if we're going to be in and out of this in the future and I want, I want to come back and say something about that but um i think you know the, the one thing that i think is we can do is we need to bring teachers back in you know i think that a lot of parents maybe most parents um felt that uh, their, their appreciation of what teachers do actually increased dramatically during that first period of mm -hmm. lockdown because it's you know it's not just standing in front of the class and you know reading out some stuff to the kids it's it's a really skilled and difficult job um, mm -hmm. so that so one thing that uh, is now available or has been available for, for quite a while in in this country is um uh, it's called Oak National Academy, and this is um, online. Uh, but the, it is the, the big, big difference is that it's um, they're complete filmed lessons, so videoed lessons. So relative to having the um, you know you have a Zoom meeting with your classmates and your teacher, it's not interactive, but it is um, lessons from top top rated teachers. You know, on your subject in your curriculum at the time of the year when you need it. So, I think uh, while it's not completely perfect, I think it's um, I think it's very good, and I I would like to see that you know schools being encouraged a bit more strongly perhaps to use that um, uh, to use that. The thing I was going to add was that um, you know okay so now schools are back so great you know problem over not really um, although attendance in schools is um, on average, quite high. Um, yeah. There are neighbourhoods, local authorities in the country where attendance is only like 60%, 70%, something like that. So we're still, you know, a third, um, maybe more of children are not going to school as much as they should. Um, and, and guess what? Those, the, the, the neighbourhoods where the attendance is lowest are those that are also the poorest. Okay, so that's clearly a problem. So let's talk about the return to school now. Um, how do you think we should be encouraging people back into schools? Not as an epidemiologist, obviously, but what do you think is best practice for um, um, the, the reopening of schools, especially as it's been, it seems it's one of the government's priorities being in schools are going to remain open while there is a national lockdown? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's, um, uh, I'm very pleased they've done that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, it's clear there are going to be areas of the country where infection rates are very high, <clears throat> where that's going to be challenging um, for parents and for teachers. But nevertheless, I, I am very glad that they've um, maintained that as a priority. So I think, you know, to be honest, I think... Um, I would guess that most children are keen to go. I don't. I don't really think they go. The children are going to need much of a way of encouragement to go back to school. Parents, you know, there will definitely be different opinions among parents. Um, a lot of parents were that I, that I spoke to were very keen, um, you know, before the summer holidays, to to for their children to go back, you know, for the for the children's sake and and for their own sakes, either. Um, for, um, you know, frankly, a bit of peace and quiet, but also to, to allow them to work, you know, either to allow them to go out to work or to allow them to focus on um, their, the jobs that they were doing working at home. And this has been particularly uh, relevant and important for, for women at home. You know, there was some data from um, uh, the IFS survey of people at home and in, in contexts where there were two parents and they were both trying to work and also they had kids trying to learn, um, uh, you know, the results showed that it was her that was interrupted at work much more often than it was, than it was him. And so the, the idea of being able to sort of focus for a period of time, I think is really important. Yeah, that's very true. And I think it's, um, 
this sort of idea of the school being the caretaker is particularly relevant at the moment, especially when you consider Marcus Rashford's campaign to have um, school meals um, available during holidays. So do you think the school's caretaking duty should be extended into the holidays? And if so, do you think that's particularly a concern now when we're going into um, national lockdown again with potential, potentially huge economic consequences? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I've got particularly any expertise on that, but I mean, I think, um, but both in, you know, in terms of the, some of the things that I was mentioning earlier, sort of uh, a place to play with your friends, a place to feel safe uh, and a place to, 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 to get um, more nutritious food and to, do, and to have exercise. I think those are very important points. Um, mm. And so I think if, if schools... So I, I, you know, I have no idea about the, the the feasibility of this, but if schools were able to kind of remain open over a half term and uh, um, kind of look after their children, I mean, I think I think probably half terms be, has happened in in many places. Yeah. But I mean, I think um, so that would be a good idea. I, I, um, but yeah, I think that would be a good idea if that if that had been feasible, that would have been a good idea. You also mentioned there sort of like the non-cognitive skills that children pick up in school. So like, you know, social skills, that sort of thing. Are there any age groups that you are particularly concerned is going to miss out in that respect? So I think, um, OK, so I'll, I'll answer that. The, the non-cognitive skills and also their um, cognitive skills. Yeah. So I think when we're thinking about, you know, who loses out most from, from school closures, I think the answers are probably at the, at the two ends. Um, I think, you know, it's obvious why um, uh, GCSE age children, A-level age children, um, you know, had a really um, kind of rotten deal, a, a tough time over the summer um, in the sense that their, their qualifications that they'd been building up to for, you know, a year or two um, were completely sort of messed around. So, um, and the A-level students are uh, potentially, you know, roughly half of them coming out into a labour market that's going to be a bit of a mess, uh, at the very least. Um, but also the, ch the youngest children, the, ch the children who were basically just started school year one, year one, year two, that kind of thing. Um, you know, their, the amount of schooling that they've lost is, is a substantial fraction of the amount of schooling that they should have had. And we know from, um, you know, a lot of research, uh, Jim Heckman, many others, that uh, schools, skills build on skills, you know, that, that, that there is complementarity through time of investment in your skills. And um, so missing out early, I, I fear there is a danger that, that, um, that catching that up is going to be, is going to be really hard. Um, and uh, so I, I, I worry a lot about those kids. And I think just to, to, to kind of um, come back to your question, I mean, I think that definitely applies to non-cognitive skills as well as more co as, you know, cognitive skills. Um, it, it's, again, it's about the socialization. It's about uh, picking up on, you know, social cues and social skills and so on developing uh, an interest in learning, developing your conscientiousness, your focus and so on. Um, and th that's going to be harder as time goes on. Okay, um, fantastic. So you also mentioned, you. so I'm going to pick up on something you said about A11 GCSE students and the sort of really awful uh, time they seem to have had of it. Um, so obviously there was a need to replace um, uh, a levels like sitting exams um what and a lot of there's like a push for some of that to be teacher assessment do you have any concerns about teacher assessment as a way to um uh set a qualification yeah so i think i think it's, it's important to say first of all that probably in the circumstance teacher assessment was based something based on teacher assessment was probably the only feasible thing to do Mm -hmm. um, but I think that could have been handled so much better, um, mm -hmm. just as a ma matter of sort of practicalities and as a matter of politics. Um, but yeah, in, in, in general terms, um, teacher assessment is, is a problem, partly because teachers tend to, um, as indeed anyone does, it's, it's a very general finding, 
um, tend to be biased towards the middle, you know, so relative to exam scores, um, you know, which tend to spread people out, uh, teachers never give really high grades, teachers never give really low grades. There's, there's a bunching together, which, um, you know, okay, you could say that's being kind to the low achievers, but it's not being kind to the high achievers. And it's, it's you know, I, I don't know if it's a good thing in the end. But the more, the more concerning issue is that um, teachers can be prone to bias when they are um, awarding their grades. And um, uh, so we, we've done some work on that. Others have done some work on that. And it, one of the things that seems to come up is the idea of, st the idea of stereotype bias. So what this means is that um, you as a teacher, you're, you are required to um, you know, write down your assessment of the work of this child uh, through the year. And you have two sort of parts of information. You have your own personal view of this kid in front of you. And then you have a sense of you know, how children like that do overall. So for example, um, you, know, you, might, you as a teacher might have the view, well, girls are good at writing and boys are good at maths. Or you might have the view that um, children from wealthier families are cleverer or are better behaved. You might have the view that children of Indian ethnicity or Chinese ethnicity, for example, are really good at science, really good at maths. So that's what I mean by a stereotype, mm -hmm. sort of outside information from, from somewhere else that you use to influence your uh, your grade for the person, for the student. And, you know, so, so we found evidence for that, strong evidence for that in the data for exams in this country. And, you know, one of the things that means different things, you know, there's, there's different sort of aspects of that in terms of um, gender bias, different aspects in terms of ethnicity bias. Um, but in terms of sort of social class and poverty, it's completely clear that teachers uh, tend to underassess the abilities of um, poor students in English and maths and science. Another way of saying the same thing is that when children get a chance to do an, an anonymous exam to show what they can do unmediated by their teacher's view, they're much more likely to outperform what the teacher thought, that they, the teacher hadn't really got a sense of their abilities. And when they can show their abilities, as I say, in, in an anonymous setting, uh, they do really well and you know the teachers continually kind of being surprised by how well they're doing so yeah so so um if at, you know at various times you know pre-pandemic it's been suggested that we should switch to teacher assessments um and i've always been very much against that for the, for, the, for that reason that there are you know otherwise children are simply going to be labeled by what their, te their teachers view of them rather than what they can actually do and so when when it became clear that um uh, teacher assessments were kind of going to be central to uh, the assessments at the end of um, last year, uh, last academic year in school. Um, yeah, definitely did have concerns. Um, and um, I suggested a particular way of trying to, to deal with that. But, um, uh, you know, the way that it was dealt with, I think, was um, you know, really clumsy and Un, un, unkind and unfair I think. So bouncing off of that first I'd like to ask well what was your way and secondly what do you think specifically were the problems with the way it was standardized in the way of, you know it was not the algorithm what do you think particularly were the problems with that? Okay so I think um, so you know it, it wasn't a particularly uh, sort of fancy or you know unheard of idea but I mean I think I think what we should have done would be to have a procedure where we would lock in the, the differentials between uh, males and females, between different ethnicities, between uh, poor and non-poor students from last year. So that the, the, the test score uh, difference between students who were eligible for the pupil premium and those who weren't, you know, we should just replicate that this time so that none of those biases that I just mentioned would be would would come in 
so what we what we would do would indeed we'd ask teachers for their uh, grades for each student for each subject, and then um, uh, in a in a complicated regression setting, we could compute, we could adjust all those um, in order to precisely deliver the same uh, test score gaps that we saw last year in the summer of 2019. So that would respect the, um, the decisions of individual teachers, but there would be some rebalancing. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, that would mean that some students might do better, might be given a mark above their teacher assessment, some might be given a mark below. So again, you know, the, um, there, would be, there would be children who would be um, upset that they'd sort of got less than their teacher said and some who got more. So there would still, you know, there would be no way of, of making everybody happy. Um, I, so that's what I thought would be definitely be feasible. I mean, there would still be practical problems. So um, one of the practical problems would be that, that that procedure would give you a continuous variable, would, you know, would give you a number of, um, once yeah. you've applied a ratio. But we have we have A star. Well, we actually we don't now do. We have nine, A, eight, seven, six. So we have fixed categories. So around those boundaries, there were different problems. So I think the problem with the algorithm, actually, um, Stephen Proud, my colleague Stephen Proud, has written a really nice, uh, clear summary of this, which on the yeah, Economics Observatory that I would encourage you to read. The basic problem was that Ofsted were asked to do two things: um, to, uh, you know, you basically use teacher assessments, but to have no no grade inflation. Um, teacher assessments are always going to be too high. And so the, 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 the comment, so the, the core of it, there were technical details as well. Um, you know, there are a number of technical details that, that um, probably we, we don't want to go into here, but the, the core problem was um, we're going to have, we're going to have zero grade inflation and we're going to uh, respect the, uh, um, the uh, teacher assessments. And I mean, I think, you know, no grade inflation sounds like that's a mechanical thing. But I mean, I think, I think it's clear from what actually ended up happening is that it's not a mechanical thing. Um, the, the cohort who um, did their A-levels this summer have got dramatically higher grades given to them than those who um, graduated in, in the previous couple of years. So, you know, maybe they're stunningly smarter than, than previous years. They certainly had, you know, a, le a less good teaching in the, in the final bit of their school career. It can't be that. Um, so then those kids are going to be sort of, um, some of them will have, uh, some of them may have gone to university when perhaps they wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, so we, we're going to follow their progress with interest, but I would imagine the people in the year below, uh, at graduating school in the year below, you know, I might feel a bit hard done by, I don't know. Um, yeah, fair enough. It's all quite complicated. And um, yeah, so there's no easy solution, basically. Um, we've talked a lot about um, teacher bias, but I, um, not to leave them too much of a downer on teachers, because obviously they're very important. I want to um, bring up some of your research from a while ago about teacher efficacy. Um, I find it quite interesting in the context of how important to, it is for students to go to school to talk about the role, of, the role that teachers play in that. So um, can you talk uh, to us a, a, lot of, uh, a, a little about um, uh, the research you've done that show that teachers have um, a positive impact on test scores that can't be explained by anything else and um, talk about your research in this area because it seems quite, I imagine it seems quite intuitive to some of our audience, but can you talk about um, the process you uh, went on while you were um, trying to find that relationship? Okay, okay. so the question is um, <clears throat> about trying to uh, measure um, the impact of teachers on test scores. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all uh, remember um, teachers we had at school who um, really enthused us and were, were fantastic at getting us excited and interested and uh, getting us to concentrate and work hard and, and who were brilliant at explaining things, you know. Um, 
and probably we also all remember teachers who were not like that and just sort of turned us off and um, you know you never want to go near that teacher or indeed that subject again um, so I, I can definitely remember actually they were both history teachers I had one uh, history teacher who got me really really interested in uh, voyages of exp exploration and discovery and I, I still read stuff about that now you know and that was that was a very long time ago and I also had another history teacher who basically just spent the entire lesson just writing on the board and your job as a student was just to write about that, that was dreadful so in, intuitively I think we all know that teachers matter a great deal and since about sort of 2008, there have been a series of studies, mostly in America, but we did one for this country, um, where we can try and measure that uh, and try and get a sense of um, what is the impact in terms of GCSE scores or whatever it happens to be in, in different countries of being with an effective teacher as opposed to being with an ineffective teacher. And there are different ways. Um, there are different ways of um, trying to uh, um, um, calibrate that. <clears throat> but the one that, one that comes out from from the piece we did is that um, if you if you imagine uh, if I'm going to call an effective teacher a teacher who's at the 75th percentile of the distribution of teacher effectiveness, and an ineffective teacher. Uh, is a teacher who is at the 25th, the 25th percentile. Okay, so they're not the extremes, but they're, you know, they're, they're some way apart. So we showed that if, um, if a student had, we, we compare a student who was, who had all ineffective teachers for all, let's say, eight subjects at GCSE, so English, math, science, history, French, German, all those, with a student who had all effective teachers for those eight subjects, or just two years of their school career, just that switch over, over two years would um, remove half of the test score penalty of coming from a, a poorer family, a poorer neighborhood. And that's just stunning. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the, this, this disadvantage gap is one of, you know, one of the most fixed and, and biggest numbers and that, and that really affects people's future life chances. So then the question, you know, and there are other metrics. So um, uh, another one that I uh, uh, trot out from time to time is to think about how much, uh, it's, you know, in terms of uh, a more common metric maybe. Um, so if a teacher helps you to get better qualifications, better, for co better qualifications lead you to higher lifetime earnings, then you can, you can, you know, calculate if you like how much uh, being with an effective teacher adds to your lifetime earnings okay and if you think about how many years teachers teach for okay it adds up to a lot of money um, and just how much money it adds up to was was calculated by uh, Rick Hanashek uh, I guess one of the um, leading education economists and he's out in Stanford and he showed that if we could somehow uh, invent a policy that would take the lowest 8%, the least effective 8% of teachers and magically turn them into averagely effective teachers. So not superstars, just average. And just, just kind of move the bottom tail of the teacher effectiveness distribution. Then the uh, expected present value of that policy would be $100 trillion. Okay, so that's a very large number. It's the <laughs> largest number I've ever heard. Um, and even if he's out by an order of magnitude, even if it's out by two orders of magnitude, you know, it's just an immensely effective policy. So teachers are indeed, you know, the most effective um, uh, public policy aspect of schools. I mean, you know, families are very important too, but in terms of public policy. Um, I think you asked how we went about that. Uh, if, if you, you need to connect, clearly you need to connect uh, students taking test scores with, um, with, with with the teacher that taught them. So you need a class list. You need a, you know, which pupils did Joe Smith teach? Uh, did, did Joe Smith teach biology? Okay. Um, and those are those are hard to come by. So that was that that took a lot of work. Still does take a lot of work. But that that's that's what that's the key thing you need to be able to do that well. And. Um before we um, move on to questions, and I've seen one come in so far, um, could you um, 
tell uh, could you um so this uh, stuff about teachers is quite you know encouraging but i think it does raise questions about the distribution of those teachers can you uh, talk a bit about that yeah no you're absolutely right um uh, we would want to know where the most effective teachers teach and where the least effective teachers teach and maybe you know, if we were a social planner, we might want to assign them to particular schools and particular students. Um, the, the, the difficulty is, um, so there are two, there are two difficulties. The, the data difficulty is that um, in order to do that, you would need to be able to measure the teacher effectiveness of all of the teachers, all of the half million mm. teachers in the country. And the, the data simply don't exist to do that. We have wonderful data about pupils, and for the last 10 years, we have wonderful data about teachers, but there's nothing that links them other than being in the same school. We can't, there's no national register of class lists. Um, the second difficulty, of course, is, you know, even when you've, even if you were able to do that, um, you know, you have, there has to be a mechanism to uh, make or encourage, you know, effective teacher A to go and work in, teach in school B, you know, and um, that might be possible, I don't know, um, in, in co other countries. So for example, in France, the teacher labor market is incredibly centralized. And you, you the school, you the school leader, you just get sent teachers, you know, you, you don't hire them, you don't choose them, you've never met them before. They just arrive on your door to step and say, hi, I'm going to teach history here. And so there's, there's, you know, you need something like that, which uh, schools in this country have not had for a good long time, if ever, actually. Okay, um, so we'll hold it there for questions from me for now um, and move on to questions from the audience. Um, the first one here is from Hugo, um, who is interested in what sort of evidence exists to support um, in uh, in person teaching with you know PPE rather than teaching online, and he's interested in um, why universities aren't as willing to go fully online. I know universities aren't your area of expertise, but could you talk a bit about um, what evidence is uh, supports in person teaching rather than the alternatives? Okay, well I'll I'll start with schools since that is what I know about. Mm -hmm. and see if I can um, talk from there. So I mean I think. I think for, so again, this is for school children, for school age children, um, particularly the younger ones, I think, I think having a real life teacher there is incredibly important. I think that it's very difficult for them to, um, uh, you know, learn for anything like a, a whole school day from, from online, online material alone. Okay, so I think that that is um, widely accepted and I think that's why you know, even maybe if, if in a perfect environment, I think, I think, you know, a perfect online environment would still be um, uh, uh, very difficult um, relative to having an actual teacher. So in terms of uh, PPE and so on, um, so we wrote a report, some colleagues and I wrote a report for the Royal Society about uh, reopening schools. It was called Balancing the Risks of Opening Schools. Um, and so we discussed at length uh, the, the pros and cons of having children learn, learn online or learn in school, uh, in school meaning with a, with a live teacher, with a face-to-face -face teacher. And we recommended that um, uh, um, uh, teachers should be given, sorry, let me, let me restart that. We recommended that uh, teachers and secondary school and older students should wear face coverings and that schools should be given a few full PPE sets, but you know, not one for every single teacher that didn't seem to be necessary. And we recommend, we recommended that primary school children did not need face coverings. I noticed that um, uh, in France, um, in their latest uh, lockdown regulations, children down to the age of six were gonna be asked to wear uh, face coverings. So I think, you know, I don't know, the, the, the evidence that we saw in, in June and July was that that wasn't necessary for young children. Um, so, okay, so moving on to, to universities, I haven't, I really haven't got that much to say. Um, 
I think um, a lot of the government messaging um, lumps together schools and universities. That's just, you know, it's just a thing they talk about. And I think that's um, very, very unhelpful. I think they're very different things, um, mm -hmm. both in terms, obviously, of the age of the student. Um, we know that uh, young children are, uh, so again, it's, it's kind of unclear what exactly young children means, but maybe up to 12 or 13 are uh, less likely to become infected, are very much less likely to suffer um, uh, severe symptoms, and are less likely to transmit the disease uh, than older children are, okay? Um, uh, kind of late teens, mid-late teens are, um, I think, maybe a little bit less than uh, adults likely to transmit and to become infected. But are still um, yeah, so they're they're very different from from little kids. University age students, I think, are you know are adults, and so there's no difference between um, their rates of transmission, their rates of infection. Um, partly it depends on how broad the age categories are when people report data on this. But I mean, I think I think we should expect university students to be as um, uh, likely to transmit and become infected themselves as you know people in their 20s and 30s um, uh, so so yes the universities are different from schools in terms of the age of the, the students and also in terms of the nature of the education so I think um, online education I think is much more feasible for uh, for um, university students probably even for A-level students than it is for um, six-year-olds or 12-year-olds. Um, and I, you know, I do believe that, uh, you know, even before the, the pandemic came along, there was a lot of discussion amongst people who study, um, you know, ways of teaching in universities that we were gonna, that we were gonna be changing the way that we taught towards a much more blended system for learning. And there are some things that people do not have to sit in a lecture hall for, and there's some things where, um, that's much more helpful. Obviously, the pandemic has, you know, dramatically accelerated that, um, and everybody's, you know, scrabbling to try and do the do the best job they can in in the situation. Yeah. Well, so talking about university teaching, research teaching, we have a follow on question from Ben. Um, so things like live lectures online, um, and other responses to the coronavirus. Do you think any of those will become more permanent? And do you think these um, changes will be beneficial for the sector? Okay, um, I don't know. Um, I think <laughs> that, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more, but yeah. <laughs> it's going to sort of build on that theme. Um, uh, the so permanent, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there will be permanent changes. But again, I'd, I'd make the point that um, universities were sort of heading in the direction of uh, more blended learning, sort of some um, recorded material, some online material and some face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, so quite a long time ago, MIT um, put on put online, I think almost all of its uh, main lectures, which, which was an astonishing thing to do. Um, so they, they felt that the, the, uh, the quality of their education was, would not suffer from, from doing that. So I think, I think um, uh, I, I'm sure that, that some aspects of what we're doing now, um, albeit done at a more relaxed pace than now, will, will continue. Um, and obviously there will be a lot more um, uh, fine tuning and you know, variation because it has all been done at an incredible pace. Um, uh, and I'm sure some of it will stick, some of it will change. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but I mean, I think that probably is where we are. Uh, and we're all, you know, we're all, we're all learning on, you know, on both sides of the desk as it were. Um, and universities are learning incredibly quickly now. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it's, a, you know, now is a very, very odd situation, very, very, uh, unsettling, scary situation. Um, so some of that learning won't be of use in the future, in, in normal times, quote unquote. Um, but I think a lot of the learning about how we're doing, the, you know, how we're doing this is will will be of value. That's um, interesting. Um, 
So to bring it to uh, Bristol University a bit, uh, the SU um, uh, decided that it would start pushing to, uh, to move lectures entirely online and um, have classes online as well. Do you think it's likely that um, schools, so for uh, six uh, four, or four to 18, might have to move entirely online again in the future? And if they do, do you think there's a best practice that should be taken? I have to say, I think that if if um, education for uh, four to 16 year olds, let's say 40, 15, 14 year olds were to move permanently online, I think that would be a bad development. Mm -hmm. I think a lot, a huge amount would be lost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to, to more or less what, what we started with from your first yeah. question, um, you know, I think schools are an arena where, where you learn how to grow up, where you, meet, you know, you have to interact with people who are not your family, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to, to get along and share stuff and cooperate and, and you know, and the, the joys of doing that, the joys of playing with someone else. So I think if, if you know, every, every child uh, was kind of at home, you know, maybe with a sibling, but maybe not. Um, and that's kind of how they learn. I think that would be a, a, a that's just a dystopian nightmare. I think. I mean, that would just be dreadful. Um, mm -hmm. I don't whether whether they technically learn more or not. I don't know, but I think it would be um, uh, a, a very bad uh, route to take. And I, I don't honestly think anyone's proposing that or no. contemplating that for school aged children. No, that's fair enough. And um, so we've talked, you know, in intervals about um, how important it is for uh, children to interact with, you know, people outside of their usual social circle. Um, I find this interesting in the context of some research you did, um, you've been doing for a while about um, sort of school segregation. Um, and um, so could you talk a bit about that and where it is a problem most of the time, um, how to address it. This is a very, uh, sorry, another long uh, multifaceted question. And, um, I've, and I've forgotten where I was going with it. Um, so, uh, yeah. so yeah, so where it comes from, what can be done about it and who it affects the most. Okay, so that, that definitely is going to take about three hours to answer. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, try and to, to shorten that a little bit. So yeah, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, school segregation was, you know, one of the, one actually of the first things that that uh, colleagues and I here uh, studied using the the exciting new data I was telling you about. Um, and um, schools in this country, you know, are definitely uh, socially segregated. So there are some schools with uh, higher fraction than you would imagine of richer kids, other schools, and quite nearby with a higher fraction than you would imagine from the from the neighbourhood of poorer kids. Ethnic segregation as well. Um, uh, ethnic segregation varies a lot around the country, uh, and I think we were one of the first groups to uh, to kind of measure ethnic segregation in schools and to compare it to the neighbourhoods. So ethnic segregation is uh, higher for some groups than others. Um, I haven't looked at this recently, but I mean, I, <clears throat> it was always the case that ethnic segregation in schools was higher for students of uh, Pakistani ethnicity, Bangladeshi ethnicity, um, was less so for students of um, Black Caribbean, Black African ethnicity. Um, uh, I think it was the highest for Bangladeshis actually at, at the time. And it varies a lot by place. So London is less segregated, Birmingham is less segregated, um, Oldham, Bradford, Blackburn were, and I think still are some of the um, uh, most ethnically segregated places in England. Um, nevertheless, they are way less ethnically segregated than uh, the United States, you know, for example. Mm. Yeah. That comparison is just not, it's just not right. So I'd spent a, you know, a, a lot of time, a lot of research papers looking at measuring ethnic segregation, trying to, do, trying to show whether it was going up or going down. And the answer is that it's going down. It's been going down for 10, 15 years. Um, what I really wanted was uh, an opportunity to see, you know, this, so what? So what does it do to you? You know, why? Why is ethnic segregation or social segregation, whatever? Why is it? Why is it bad? You know, 
Uh, so finally got opportunity to do this two or three years ago um, with a colleague from the LSE. And we showed that um, uh, meeting very few people of um, another group tends to lead to you having sort of bad views of that group, negative attitudes towards people of that group. So if you never meet people of another ethnicity, um, you, yeah, you tend to have quite negative attitudes towards that ethnicity and those, and those people. If you meet a lot of people, so if, if you're in your school, um, so, so if, you know, if you're, a, if, if you're a, a white student in the school and you meet a lot of um, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Chinese students, um, then you'd have much more positive attitudes towards those and they to you than if we're in a, a school system where you know all the white kids are in this school and all the Pakistani kids are in that school. That just breeds bad attitudes both ways around. So um, yeah, so I think segregation is, is, imp is very important. Um, and I think our work and other people's has shown that, that it has <clears throat> significant important impacts on people's attitudes towards other groups. What can we do about it? Well, yeah, indeed, that's a very, very good question. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all come across uh, schemes in primary school where we try and get children from different groups to, to play together. Um, it, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. There are, there are some um, amazing papers, some amazing studies. Um, uh, what was the one I was, yeah, I think, um, you know, where, where you try and get different groups to play sports together, uh, that kind of thing. And I think, you know, if, if, if there were a way of doing that kind of thing uh, at scale, then that would, that would be amazing. But it's, yeah, it, it, it kind of, it's very hard to do. And yeah. I still don't have the answer. Again, very complicated with no easy answers. So um, we've got about five minutes left and I've got another question here from Antra. You've already talked about this a bit, but do you think that the loss in education, particularly for younger students, will lead to a loss in their earnings and job uh, prospects in the future? Or do you think that's more of a concern for older students? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, if we assume that the lost learning of, of the students, you know, particularly the, the younger students, where this is going to accumulate over, over the years, if, if we make the assumption that that won't be fully remediated, then indeed they're gonna they're going to suffer um, uh, earnings losses. Um, and you know there are you know there's evidence on this. Um, uh, you know so here we are, we're all economists. We know that we with the, the, the context for getting a good causal estimate of something on something else is, is tricky. So the cases where people are able to do that are sort of slightly, um, you know, unusual cases. Uh, cases often they're case they're sort of t terrible cases. So um, when Hurricane Katrina sort of smashed New Orleans, um, people have studied the impact on children's education from from their schools being destroyed. Um, uh, another case is uh, um, uh, teacher strikes in Argentina. Uh, and the, the, the researchers there were able to show that the, the impact the uh, children affected was more or less random, sort of quasi-random exposure to these strikes. And these strikes were sort of very, very substantial. Children lost a lot of days. And um, the numbers there are that um, for uh, children who were exposed to the average amount of uh, teacher strikes in Argentina, uh, there were earnings losses of... Um, 2% for women, 3% for men, you know, in when, when those people, when those children who were in school are in uh, later life in the, um, in the workplace. So absolutely, there will be, there, there will be um, earnings losses. And when you think, when you add all that up to the, to the level of the country, um, lost skills means that the, the workforce will be, will have lower average skills. And we know from, from um, other work that uh, a, a country's growth rate depends on the skills of its workforce, and it makes total sense. And so a lower growth rate will follow from lower skills, and that, you know, the cost of that for a country is in the billions. 
So that's a very clear class to the education we've lost, but on a more individual level, I suppose, uh, Joss has, um, has a question that basically reads that seeing as that school graduates who have um, been, uh, who have, uh, you know, not received um, the same teaching that, you know, other cohorts in previous years have done because of coronavirus, because people who graduate after coronavirus are graduating with other people who were similarly affected by coronavirus. Does this cancel out the earnings loss or is this whole thing just completely blown out of the water by the aggregate loss in skills? Okay, I, I, I didn't catch all of that, but let, let me... Um, Sorry, my bad. So I think, no, I, I think um, <coughs> the connection just died for a few minutes. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is an argument. I've heard this argument made that um, mm. uh, you know ed education, skills, and earnings. It's all it's all about relativity. So if everybody's if everybody's test scores are hit and everybody has a lower you know a lower test score by ten percent or something, but the ordering of people is about the same, then you know why is that a problem? You know all it is is whether you've got a higher score than other people, but that's simply not true. Um, you know it is definitely the case that schooling is not simply about um, you know scoring higher than someone else it's going to school going to university gives you skills that's mm -hmm. why it raises your earnings potential because you are more able you are more skilled there's more that you can do when you're employed by an organization you'll be more productive and therefore you'll be paid more so if we lose skills you know, even if everybody loses skills, even if everybody around the planet loses skills, lower skills means less productive. Okay, and that's um, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid that's 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 how it'll be unless you know we can we can remediate this loss of learning. Okay, and uh, I think I think there's a reasonable consensus that the best way of doing that is through having a massive, massive program of small group tutoring. That's the most effective way of getting around this. It's a huge logistical challenge. Um, the UK National, Tutor National Tutoring Program launches this week. Um, I'm slightly concerned that it's um, not of sufficient scale to do the job, but maybe it will grow. Um, but again, I think if we if we leave this catch up um, too long, then the, the gap's just going to grow and grow. Okay, um, thank you. That's a cheerful place to um, end. Uh, but um, that was very interesting. Thank you. And um, I, I'm afraid um, that you may have some a place to run off to. Apologies if we haven't got around to your question. Uh, for the first time, uh, the undergraduate seminar will be available on YouTube. Uh, um, after it's, um, the recording's been stopped and um, we've finished here. Uh, so 